that you are God all by yourself. We are grateful that you woke us up one more time. Yeah. We don't take for granted that you guided our vehicles here safely. say thank you. God, we have come to worship. We know that we now need to hear your voice. So God, we sincerely pray and ask that you would allow your voice to be heard in mind. That we might walk out more encouraged than we walked in. That we might walk out better than we walked in might walk out with greater hope and greater possibility than when we walked in. This is our prayer. We ask it in the name of your Son and our great Savior. Amen. Because he had an insignificant message, but because his message was just more brief, than some of the major prophets, and so right. a minor prophet, <clears throat> but the prophet Malachi. If you're in the New Testament, come to Bible study this Wednesday, amen, at 7 p.m. Because that is in the Old Testament, the last book of the Old Testament. I want to bring our attention to chapter 3. And actually, what I want to do is uh, start at the, the final verse of chapter 2, excuse me. Chapter 2, verse 17 is the final verse, and then we're going to go right into chapter 3 and read that. It says, this is the English Standard Version, but please follow in whatever version you all have. It says, you have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them, or by asking, where is the God of justice? Well, behold, I send a messenger, my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. <clears throat> and then the offering of Judah. And Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. And finally then, only then, I will draw near to you for judgment. And I will be swift, a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against those who swear falsely, those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. We said last week, uh, this sounds perfect, thank you, Deacon Mitchell. We said last week, and I want to also thank in addition to our ushers, media, and our ministers who have led us uh, along with all of our leadership and membership here uh, for this great worship. Everyone who's made worship possible, we thank God for you. And most of all, we know that none of this is possible without the presence of God's Spirit. Amen. But last week we came and we started a series entitled Rekindling the Fire. Right. We said that we want to discuss how the people of faith can renew a passion for the Lord. So we, in our first uh, installment last week, we talked about remembering how it all started. That's right. <clears throat> and so on um, this week, I want to continue with rewards of the refining of fire. Woo! 
rewards of the refining fire. We said that in this life there will come a time where the fire of our spiritual fervor can begin to dwindle. Well, we said last week that contrary to what many may assume, Deacon Woodard, even the people of faith, and especially those of us who profess our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we're honest, we acknowledge that we can all reach junctures on the journey of life when the fire of our spiritual enthusiasm can begin to wane. And while this may surprise some who are here, others of us, we said, can be honest and admit that there are some burdens we will bear, some circumstances we'll endure, some situations we will encounter, some hardships that we'll have to go through that can cause the fire that once blazed in our hearts for God to dwindle and diminish. We talk about how the fact that God, the fire can dwindle when we see God heal someone else's mother, but allow ours to stay sick. You say the fire in your spiritual fervor and passion, it can dwindle when you see God give someone else a new house and you're still stuck in your apartment. They have equity and you're just leasing. You said the fire can dwindle when you see someone else experience deliverance and you're still waiting on yours. We said that fire can, can dwindle when someone else's marriage seems to be great and yours is in the dumps. We said that that fire can, can dwindle uh, when, when, when someone else's children are doing all right, but yours seem to be stuck in trouble all the time. He said that the fire of our fervor and our passion, it can, it can dwindle, it can wane when we see God work miracles in other people's lives, but we, we, we look at God and it appears that he's put our situation and our hardship, our prayers and our requests on hold. But we acknowledge that if you stick around long enough, somebody ought to help me right here, that God sometimes, watch this, will allow you to watch somebody else get their deliverance, watch somebody else get their miracle, watch somebody else move into their new house, because here it is. If you can't celebrate God moving in somebody else's life, he may be withholding his blessings in your life. Talk. 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 And so, we said that in order to begin to rekindle the fire of our fervor, our passion, our energy, our enthusiasm, when the thrill is gone, when you have more bad days that you can remember than good days, when, when you have more complaints and more criticism than you do compliments for one another. My, my, my. We said that you have to remember how it all started. Yeah. That's what we said, Doc. Right. We said that in order to rekindle that fire, you've got to remember how God started this. You've got to remember where it all began. We said that God assigned value to all of our lives. Yes, sir. We said that the prophet Malachi told the people, Jacob, I love. Esau, I hate. I hate, yep. He had to remind them not that God was an evil, manipulative God that literally hated the people, the descendants of Esau, but that God in his sovereignty loved Esau less and favored Jacob more. Yeah, yeah. So English translations say he hated Esau. What that literally, what that simply means theologically is, no, I favor Jacob and not Esau. Because we, uh, we acknowledged last week, God often 
often flips our ethic, our preconceived notions upside down. Yeah. So he blessed the younger son, the younger brother, not the elder brother. Because he wanted to show that I cannot be boxed in to your notions of how I ought to be God, but I'm going to be God the way I choose to be God. And do I have anybody here that is glad that God will be God and won't take a vote on whether or not your enemies think you ought to be blessed? God won't consult anybody about what he wants to do in your life. God won't take a poll. He won't take any statistics. He won't take a survey. But do I have anybody that can wave your hand at me? Because you know that God is sovereign, that God is strong, that God is mighty, that God is powerful, that God is able, and that God is willing, and that God is gracious, and that God is forgiving, and that when he gets ready, he'll bless your life, and he'll lift your life, and he'll encourage you, and he'll sustain you, and he'll keep you, and he'll direct you, and he'll forgive you. Help yourself, man. Stay right down, Doc. Stay right down. Stay right down. So Jacob, I love. Esau, I hated. I favored your life and didn't allow naysayers to have any. So he assigned value. We didn't earn anything. He said, I simply love. Malachi told him, God first loved us. Right. And see, let me just slide this in. Help yourself, man. Because we cannot earn God's love, right. we cannot unearn God's love. Right. Meaning, because we cannot merit it, we cannot do anything to warrant God's love, God's mercy, God's affection, God's grace, our salvation. That means after you get through watching a, 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 a Yonla fix my life, you need to come in and let God fix your life. I, I think she's a very skilled sister in what she does, but I need to, I need to give a news flash to somebody. I watch the show too, but after I get through watching that, I reopen this. Because if I stop with what she does, and I don't come to what God can do, I'll spend my whole life trying to fix what is broken and fail. Oh, that's it. So for all the folk that don't come to church or you're visiting for the first time in a while because you think the church is full of hypocrites, full of messed up folk, full of liars and full of cheaters and full of folk that treat people bad sometimes and full of folk that gossip, guess what? Let me, let me be brutally honest with you. You're right. <laughs> Yeah. This is just review. I hadn't got to 
text said, but come on with me for the review, because some of us weren't here last week. But in review, God, we said God gives us value, not other people. Now watch this. People can add value, but they cannot assign value. That's reserved for the Lord. Yeah. They go to ghost. I've been fearfully. Come on and help me. Wonderful. Wonderfully made. That means God designed me and only me uniquely. Yeah. Yeah. Value. And that also means if you don't like me, that's too bad. Help yourself, Doc. Help yourself. Man. I was going to say you want lucky, but I don't like that connotation. So, what, what, one tiger doesn't, doesn't run the show. Don't stop, no show. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I don't like the connotation of the monkey, so I don't use tiger. <laughs> talk, man, talk. I was going to say elephant. But I didn't want to have a negative connotation attached to it. You working? I'm glad you all can smile in church. <laughs> so people add value, but they don't assign. Yes, sir. Yeah. And that's why young adults, students, young people, you can't let some young knucklehead think that he assigns value to your body, to your future. You can't let some young lady who looks fine and smells fine and looks good and runs track and is a cheerleader, all that's good. But if she doesn't have any sense in here, if she doesn't have any principles in here, if she doesn't have any vision, any dreams about what she wants her life to be, if he doesn't have a plan for the next two years, five years, ten years, God may change it, but at least have a plan. <laughs> Come on. Good because you. Jacob I love, Esau I hate. Then he said, I'm a, God has assured us of victory. He said, because anything the enemy does, anything they erect, any structures they build, any efforts they take, I'm going to stifle their abilities. That's right. And we shouted last week because we said that God, watch this, does not necessarily always remove the presence of the enemy. He allows them to stay present. But again, he'll set the table before you in their presence. He'll stifle what they can do. So that means he'll sometimes give you a boss that mistreats you. He'll make you subordinate to a manipulative superior. But then what he'll do is he'll get in the situation and he'll change it around so that they and you can see him work. Right. Yes, sir. Oh, oh. So we said that we have to remember how it all started. That's how it started. God loved us. God gave us value and God assured us of victory. But today, we have to switch gears. All right. All right. I'm not going to take too long because uh, it might get a little rough. <laughs> and so I don't want to uh, sugarcoat it. I'm just going to tell you, you, you get, I hope you got all your amens in because <laughs> they may not get any better as we go forward. <laughs> teach, man. Teach. Amen. Teach, Doc. <laughs> teach. Because in this text, we hear Israel complain. Yes, sir. You see, in chapter 1, the prophet had to remind them of their complacency. But today, we have to deal with their complaint. Because the prophet says, according to God, you have wearied the Lord with your word. Woo. Lord have mercy. You say, how have we, how have we wearied God? Prophet responds according to God's inspiration by saying that everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them. Or by raising the question, where is the God of justice? Wow, wow. Now can we be honest real quick? All of us, if we're honest, and if we turn on the television or if we sign in on our, our tablets and our phones, we've all raised 
these questions at some point in our life. Yes, sir. Where is God when I need him? Right. Right. Yes, sir. We've all looked at television, we've all looked at the news, and we, we you can look at that White House and you don't have to go beyond that. And you can, there's enough going on and not going on there. <laughs> You get tempted to say, God, where are you? Where is the God of justice? And it seems like, God, you're taking delight in allowing folk that are up to no good to be up to no good. And I'm coming to church, and I'm coming to choir rehearsal, I'm coming to Bible study, and I'm still broke. I'm, 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 I'm coming to Bible study, I'm, I'm trying to be faithful, I'm trying to serve, I'm trying to be a, a, a participant in the church's ministries, and I'm still sad, I'm still lonely, I'm still single, I'm still waiting, I'm still working, I'm still crying late at night, I'm still walking my floor. God, where are you? Yeah. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Right. Fair. And so while it's an honest assessment of the nature of life and our emotional upheaval as human beings, that's only part of the picture. Because we already said their complaint has only come to, to, to be come to the forefront because they have failed first to remember that they started this with their complacency, their indifference, their apathy, their spiritual malaise. They, they lost their enthusiasm first. And then when they looked around, then they started asking God, God, why does it look like everybody else is having fun except us? And so, after we remember how God started this, here's the good news and the bad news all together. <laughs> Every one of us, just like Israel, will have to go through a refining season. Yeah, wow. If we're going to rekindle that fire, if we're going to rekindle and regain some enthusiasm, some passion, some energy, we're going to have to be refined. And in this text, we find out that we are, first of all, matured in this refinement process. Okay. Because if you look at verse, verses 2 and 3, it says, He is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soul. This is God being described. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and He will purify the sons of Levi, refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring new offerings in righteousness to the Lord. So we see the fire of the refining process and we see the soul of the fuller. Yeah. The fuller in biblical antiquity is one who cleaned. So we see the fire of the refining process, the soul of the cleansing process. Our maturity, here it is, must come with isolation and intensity. Woo! Walk with me real quick to unpack that. You see, precious metals had to be heated in the fire in order to ensure the removal of impurities. Impurities, right? yeah. Right. So impurities, we know, are anything that diminishes the value and the quality of the precious metal. Right. And so Israel needed some things removed. Yeah. Yeah. They needed their attitude of entitlement removed. Yeah. They needed their complacency removed. Yeah. They needed their apathy and indifference removed. Right. What do you and I need removed? Woo! Fair. That's fair. What is it, Minister Gray and Washington, that, that, that we need God to take out? If I'm going to be a better pastor, a better preacher, if you're going to be a better member, a better disciple of Christ, what is it that we need removed? Yeah. Is it arrogance? Mm. Is it hypocrisy? Mm. Is it hostility? Mm. Is it pretense? Mm. Is it gossiping? Wow, wow. Wow. See how some of us act like Notice I didn't say profanity. <laughs> not that that's not on the list too. But you can gossip without ever using profane language 
language in the literal sense. But it's all profane anyway. It's my fault. Yeah. Because we can sit here, laugh, smile, hug and kiss, and get right out there and gossip and tear somebody down after we look them in the eye and smile and tell them, God bless you. We've got to have some things removed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If I want my marriage to, to be sustained, we're coming out on eight years, but if I want my marriage to be sustained, I can't come home without asking God to remove some things right. from my mind, my mouth, my spirit. That's right, man. Because yeah. right. Alexis doesn't want to be around me if I don't have anything positive to offer. Right. See how some of us act right there? No, that's right. That's right. <coughs> News flash. This message is not for your neighbor. It's for you. <laughs> this message, God reminded me, Al, is for you. That's right. That's right. You're going to preach it, but I'm going to hit you upside the head a few times before you get out there. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's intense. But see, it's also an isolation. It's, it's an isolated experience to be refined by God. Because he describes God, we said, as a refiner, but also as a fuller. He says there's the fire of the refining process and the fuller's soap. We got to unpack that real quick, our two minutes. See, in biblical antiquity, fuller's had to reside outside the city limits often, or during their work, they had to reside for their work, their profession, their, their cleansing profession. See? And the reason they had to do this is because the fullers had the responsibility of trampling or beating the clothing that had to be cleaned. And then they had the responsibility of soaking it. And when the English translation says soak, that's not that that's incomplete because while there were different substances used, it's not like you and I think about dumb. Teach, man, teach. We're not talking about dub and oil mole and vino and whatever else you use. But in biblical antiquity, fullers often used old urine. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. Here's why. Because when you take putrefied, old, stale urine and you soaked the clothes, the salt content would help clean the clothes. Teach! Teach! But the odor was so bad that none of them were allowed to wash within in time. They had to go out. But isn't it pretty profound and powerful that God would clean Israel by taking them through this isolated, ugly process. Yeah. Come on now. Thank you, Holy Ghost. You remember Naaman? The Bible says that Naaman was a valiant uh, military soldier with great military prowess, but he had leprosy. His skin was diseased. He, he was covered head to toe with, with aggravating boils and sores. And the Bible says that he wanted a miracle. He wanted his deliverance. And sometimes what we find out is when God gives us the recipe for deliverance, we turn back around and say, God, why do I have to do this to experience my deliverance? Isn't that amazing that folk who want deliverance don't want to do what it takes to be delivered? The Bible says Naaman showed up to the prophet's house. Prophet Elijah told him, go out and dip in dirty water and you'll come up clean. Bible says he's turned around like, wait a minute. I came to you saying my skin is dirty and diseased and decrepit. And you mean to tell me the only thing you have for me is that God said go get in dirty water and I'll come up clean? God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts, thank you Holy Ghost, are higher. They exist on a higher plane than our thoughts, our methodologies. He 
dipped in dirty water and came up clean. Yeah. Yeah. Israel would have to be refined and washed and cleansed and like dirty clothes that had to be trampled and beaten and soaked in old urine and then hung up to dry. Right. Israel had to go through that. Yeah. Because that church is how we are the two. If I'm going to rekindle that fire for my God and my wife, my husband, my kids, my career, my education, whatever it is that you and I have going on, I've got to understand that I've got to be mature. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that's how God matures. He refines. He cleanses. And we are matured in this refining process. But you know, like very quickly, I like the fact that we also see mercy in the refiner's presence. We see that we are matured in the refining process, but we see mercy in the refiner's presence. Because again, the text says, he is like a refiner's fire, like fuller's soul. He will sit as a refiner. Hold on, slow down, back up. <laughs> if you read the Bible too fast, you'll miss something. He's like a refiner's fire, like fuller's soul. He will sit as a refiner and purify our silver. Hold on, slow down. Back up. There's three words in there that somebody still hadn't caught yet. They are, he will sit. He will sit. He will sit. Just like they're seated, just like you're seated. It says, he will sit. You see, the refining fire, when you look at the refining process in its literal sense, does not change the substance, the essence of the materials heated. It just removes the impurities. But then here's the other aspect of the refining fire. It, there's no chemical change in purely refining a precious metal. It removes impurities, but here it is. It also then recovers the pure form of the metal. That's, yeah. So there's removal, but there's recovery. Uh -huh. All right. The maturation process entails a removal of things detrimental to our well-being. But the mercy is discovered in the fact that God, after he removes things, he recovers. Just as the pure form of gold and silver is recovered after being refined, my spirit, your spirit, our faith, our confidence, our walk with God, we recover some things. And he's dealing with the sons of Levi. Which meant they had a distinction. They were set apart. They had a duty. Go back and read in your Bible. They were to assist in the, the affairs of the priests in the temple. Yeah. yeah. They, were, they were assistants. They were to aid. So they were distinguished. They were set apart. They had a duty. But they also had to depend on, their, on God and the people to provide for their livelihood. Right. Right. And they had to remain devoted to God. They had to do all of that and still trust God with everything. Right. Teaching, man. <laughs> and he, the prophet says, the mercy is God will sit. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that when God allows me to be refined, yeah. he doesn't leave. Yeah. Right. Right. Somebody missed your shout. Now I'm going to be done in just a minute. The mercy is God refines us, but he never walks out of us. <laughs> All right, Doc. The text says he sits. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Holy Ghost. You remember Job, don't you? Yeah. The Bible says in Job's uh, text that Job was looking for God. He was suffering. He had lost his children. He had lost his health, lost the confidence and trust of his wife. He said, all oh, that I knew I would find God. Yeah. He said, I've looked, Brother Doctor, to the north and south, east and west, and I can't find him. But later on, he said, but he knows. Somebody who's read your Bible ought to help me right there. Job said, but I know he knows the way that I take. Somebody missed that. I know that he knows the way that I take. Let me run it by you one more time. I know that he knows the way that I take. Translation.
right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I thought I'd have more people that, that got excited about the fact that God's been merciful to you. Yeah. That he sits as a refiner. Yeah. He doesn't walk out, but he sits there. Right. And as long as he's sitting there, his eyes are on us. Yeah. As long as he's sitting there, we are in his purview. That means nothing that is happening is happening with his absence and without his sanction, his permission. That's mercy. We are matured in the refinery process and we see mercy in the refiner's presence. But we're done with this. We are motivated by the refiner's promise. Oh, good, good. Because in the text it says, then, meaning after I deal with how I'm going to clean you up, after I deal with how I'm going to refine you, I'm going to heat you up. I'm going to heat you up. I'm going to dry you off. I'm going I'm to wet you up. Then I'm going to dry you off. I'm going to clean you up. I'm going to heat you up. I'm going to refine you. I'm going to stretch you. I'm going to challenge you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then. Then. Yeah. Let me try that one more time. I'm going to stretch you. I'm going to test you. I'm going to refine you. I'm going to heat you up. I'm going to wet you up. And I'm going to hang you so you can dry. And then. And then. Translation. I'm going to make you wait a while on that promotion. And then. I'm going to make you wait a little bit longer for that blessing. And then. I'm going to make you wait a little longer for me to come through on your job. And then. I'm going to make you wait a little bit longer for me to show up in your marriage, in your kids' lives, in your family trauma, in your career setback, in your educational hurdles. But then. <laughs>
that we're gonna get back to rekindling. Yeah. Fire, yeah. The fervor yeah. of our fire. Yes. It's gonna mature you. It might be painful, but it's gonna be profitable. And guess what? We said it's a Bible study, and I'm done, and we're about to stay. You got to learn that God demands that you be a contributor to the kingdom. Woo! Not, Not a just consumer. Consumer. Yeah, yeah. Because I said last two weeks, watch this. The church is the only place where we expect people, and it's okay for folk to be consumers without being contributors. We're going to deal with that next week in detail. Because he said, how have we robbed God? Signs and all. I may not see some of y'all next week. <laughs> That's all right, though. Walmart and Target won't let you be consumers without being a contributor all the time. Because if you dare go in there and try to consume without contribution, they're going to cuff you up. And that's what God does spiritually. He has to cuff us. But he cuffs us by refining us. Putting us in the crucible of the fire. And after we come out of that fire, after we've been heated up and had some impurities removed, then we come out stronger. We come out better. We come out more encouraged. We come out wiser. Anybody here glad that you came out of what you were stuck in? I'm trying to let this go, but there's real, there's a real shout in the fact that God, first of all, you can shout because some stuff you avoid in life, yeah. you bypassed it. Yeah. But there's a lot of stuff you gotta shout about because God let you walk right in yeah. and he let you stay longer than you intended to stay, yeah. just to teach you a lesson so that when he delivered you, you would never go back to where that was. And those are the rewards of the refiner's fire. You're going to mature. You're going to see God's mercy. And you're going to have a new motivation to go forward. Let's stand. Let's stand. Good word, Doc. Good word.